We're excited to be here. Uh, glad that you guys made your way from the uh, iPhone cases and made it to uh, a little bit uh, deeper discussion than you might have uh, in some of those booths. In fact, we're talking about something so important, I mean, children's health. And I love the, the way the description described it, that the child can't talk, the newborn can't talk, but the gene can. So hopefully we can share some insight in what's really happening with genomic medicine today. Uh, we'll start with just the quick intros. As she said, I'm the founder of healthcarescene.com, a network of 10 health IT blogs. Done about uh, 9,000 blog posts over 10 years. I also run the Health IT Marketing and PR Conference. Uh, let's go to my left, uh, Aaron Black from Inova Translational Medicine Institute. Want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, uh, I'm the director of informatics, so uh, our team support the research as well as that clinical application of that research to our patients within the Inova Health System. Uh, a little bit about the Inova Health System is that we're a six hospital, non-for-profit community health center uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, we serve about two million visits a year and we have a large birthing center, one of the largest on the East Coast. So the role that I play is to try to enable, we're, we're literally the translation of the translational medicine. So we take these large genomic data sets, epigenomics, we talked to the, the previous uh, Dr. Chopra that talked a lot about systems biology. We, we do a lot of that as well, Gen genetics, epigenetics, um, and we're even starting to get a little bit of microbiome. Uh, wow. So we, we, we have to translate that data into something actionable, and that's what we're here to discuss a little bit today. Excellent. Can't wait to hear your work. Uh, next up, we have Andy Day from uh, Tableau Software. Tell us about yourself and what do you do? Sure. I'm Andy Day. I'm the managing director and general manager for healthcare and life sciences at Tableau Software, headquartered in Seattle. Uh, Tableau is the fastest growing company in the history of uh, healthcare analytics, one of the three fastest growing companies in enterprise software. And uh, we're very fortunate to work with uh, innovators like Innova Health um, and the Cleveland Clinic and Intermountain Healthcare to really deliver actionable insights to physicians, doctors, nurses, clinicians at the point of care. Personally, I'd like to thank Jill for this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Deepak Chopra is a personal spiritual beacon <laughs> of mine, so it was very fortunate to be meeting him in person. And Sanjay Khurana, who just spoke previously, and I were in the same class in school in Mumbai, India, 30 years ago, and we met after 30 years today, <laughs> so which is pretty incredible. The, the beauty of technology, the way it can connect us in ways that would have never been possible before. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let, let's start off, Aaron. Maybe you can start off, because we hear all the buzzwords. We hear, oh, genomic medicine, that could change everything. But you know, it, it feels like a buzzword to, to a lot of us. So you know, what, what's really happening today? What are you doing? And you know, what are the, the results that you're seeing? Um, yeah, so I, again, coming from a translational institute, so we're, we're, we're definitely a research-focused uh, organization. But we also have the goal, the mission statement, to apply that to clinical. So there's two different sides to us. And when we look at where this hype is coming from, <laughs> it's coming from the research. I mean, there is so much data being generated right now. Um, whether it's genomics, epigenomics, um, you know, you go out in the, the conference room floor and everything is monitoring everything. Um, there's so much data there and there's so much discovery that has gone on in the last two decades. Um, we're really reverse engineering a biology and seeing it happen before our eyes. And so there's a lot of, you know, wide open, wow, they, we didn't even know this, we were peeling back these layers. Mm -hmm. However, if you want to translate that into what's happening when our patients are coming into the door, it's not matching that hype. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, possibly regulatory, uh, there's economics involved, uh, reimbursements. I mean, so there's a lot of factors of why we're not really translating as quickly as we might like, but there's reasons to do that too. We don't want to go too fast. We want to be safe. We want to be effective. We want to be ethical uh, with the way we take that data and, and put it into practice. Sure. Tell, tell us a little bit more. I know you, 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 when we talked before, I think you call them triads, right? Trios. Uh, tri trios. Okay. T tell us about trios and, and how that works and what you, you know, the database you've essentially created. Yeah. So we have a wide range of studies and a lot of our studies, we don't um, just sequence a baby or an infant. We sequence the entire family. So mm -hmm. at least the mother and the father. So that's our trio. Um, it gives us a lot more power when we're doing our analytics and, and our evaluation and even from a quality control perspective, we know a lot more about that family based on not just the infant that we sequence from birth, but the, the people that, you know, um, are, are responsible for that. So <laughs> it gives us a lot, of, a lot of power, but it also adds a lot of complexity. Um, we're building something that really doesn't have a template to say you build it this way. <laughs> and so that's why we leverage tools like Tableau, because sometimes we, you haven't seen this data in the wild yet. You know, there's, the visionaries are saying, hey, this is all great, and, but for a person like me and my team, 
how do you operationalize that? How do you know what you have? Uh, and there's tools like Tableau and a lot of technologies that can help us. Well, and I, th I think it's so beautiful that you have the whole trio of the baby, the mom, the dad, which provides a great baseline for that, that child's future as well. But, you know, I mean, going over to you, Andy, you know, how does having this information really kind of elevate the conversation? I mean, how, how can it be used? I mean, you, you know, how can it be used in personalized care? And what, what, what are you seeing done? I mean, do, do, where else does it apply? Absolutely. So I followed the evolution of this, right? It really started out as the notion of personalized medicine uh, to help pharma and life sciences companies develop drugs and, you know, in response to genomic profiles. Uh, now, precision medicine, to me, really becomes real when you can apply it to personalizing healthcare, exactly as Innova Health is doing, is how do you, I mean, there's a, there's a concept in retail, right? The lifetime value of the customer. <laughs> can we develop, can we evolve precision medicine to really deliver lifetime value, lifetime health value for the patient? Hmm. That is the holy grail, right? Clearly, we have, we have ways to go, but the pioneering work that Innova Health uh, is, is doing that we're very fortunate to partner with them on exactly lays the foundation for, for being able to do that. Look at the profile of a newborn child uh, and the parents, understand, start to identify risk for cystic fibrosis, for COPD, for cancer, and then be able to match that data as the child grows up and again, applying machine uh, you know, learning predictive analytics actually see if, 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 if the risk actually translates into disease. Hmm. But again, you're not, you've shifted the paradigm from reactive to proactive, which hmm. changes the game. Right, and just to, to piggyback off of that, um, one, of the, one of the things that we find the most kind of penetrance is in healthcare is pharmacogenomics, which is where you know, you're sequencing individual uh, uh, genes and the drug interactions with those. Um, a lot of times they order them after the patient has come in and they already have the condition. Exactly. Um, what we're trying to do at ANOVA is kind of change that, which is where uh, we're right now piloting a, a pharmaco pharmacogenomic, it's a big word, a panel. <laughs> um, so it's not just one gene to drug interaction, it's many. Exactly. And we're doing that for the, for the infants. Now, of course, that infant is not going to get a drug right away, but it's part of their health record. And back to the utility of what we're doing, we're now making that part of, you know, if they come into one of our six hospitals, now they have it. Um, so, you know, from a reimbursement side, of, right now we're doing it out of pocket. We're actually doing that as a, as a gift to, our, you know, our, our population. Um, but this is where ANOVA is trying to lead the way to say, let's move it, again, from a reactive to a proactive approach. Exactly. It's so, moved from cookie cutter medicine to, to truly evidence-based care. Yeah. And, and you guys are just paying for it yourself? I mean, as a proactive, I mean, I imagine it's some research efforts as well, or? Yeah, and again, back to the clinical versus research. That's a clinical application of research that's been done before Innova, you know, right. our institute opened five years ago. Um, but the second part of what we're doing, and this is a, a better example of a translational research project, is we have, um, again, one of the largest birthing centers on the East Coast. Uh -huh. About 10,000 babies come into our health system every year. A small percentage of those um, end up not doing very well. They end up in our neonatal intensive care unit, or NICU. Uh, even a smaller percentage of those uh, basically defy traditional diagnosis. So we're embedded in that NICU. Uh, they come to us, we, they, they work with our clinical genetics teams, our, our MDs, and we can send the patients and say, hey, can we take a shot? So at that point, that's where the trio comes in. We sequence the, the baby, we sequence the mother and the father, and we run an analysis across that. So where pharmacogenomics is one, the cancer panels, they might be multiple genes. We're looking at the entire gene set as well as everything in between. And from an IT and informatics perspective, that's a huge challenge. <laughs> and, you know, so it's a terabyte coming off the machine. It's all this computation to get it down to a binary file. Then you have to align it. You get the variance. And then you get it in front of the real talent or the people that understand what's going on. We want to do that as fast as possible as an IT unit. And we're leveraging technology uh, to make that faster. And we've had about a 60% diagnosis rate is about three times the average of what we've seen published to where we can diagnose that child who's sitting in that neonatal intensive care unit struggling its first days of life. Um, to be able to, to, to take away that cost of that diagnostic odyssey that would have to happen to properly treat them, as well as the emotional uh, cost of the parents you know, watching their baby you know, yeah. in, in, a, in a not so pretty situation. That's impressive. Quite interesting, if you, if you really think about <coughs> it, what's game changing about it is this is the closest man has gotten to playing God, if hmm. you think about it. 
I think that's what scares many people, <laughs> though, right? Like, <laughs> well, I think you have to be careful, right? Well, you know, far. and that's a situation where you're not doing uh, proactive health. You're, you know, you're you're actually treating something that's already occurred. Exactly. So for a lot of this prediction, you know, you, there's that one side, and then there's like we're already disease worrying that situation. You know, <laughs> how do you deal with it? So there's really two different arms to precision medicine. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, the interesting thing to me is that. Yeah, it's not like you go and buy off-the-shelf software that just solves the genomic sequencing of a trio, right? Like, I mean, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of expertise and skill in genomics and, and yours, and it takes powerful software. I mean, like you said, I mean, genome you know, is, is terabytes of data, especially then now you just tripled it with the trio. Uh, so, so it's a real challenge. But, you know, once you've discovered that, I mean, it's amazing that you can take the genome and improve the diagnosing process so effectively. Are there treatments available, or where are we at the scale of actually taking that diagnosis and then being able to treat it? You know, where are we at now? Again, that's kind of the slow application of that research. So it, very recently we've gotten the data. Now we have to apply it, um, look for federal regulation guidelines. We have to <laughs> find out who's going to pay for it, because at the end of the day, a hospital is still a business. Mm -hmm. It's not for profit, but it's still a business. So you right. can't throw a bunch of money on one thing. So part of the, the role of our institute is to say, how is this going to work in healthcare? Um, what are the economics behind that? Like you just said, we generate a lot of data. Where does it go? How long does it sit there? The, there's a whole security layer to all of this <laughs> that you know, we don't talk about because we want to sell things at, at a consumer electronics session. Um, <laughs> but there's part of that that we have to evaluate as a health system, not as a consumer of a product. Um, and so as we go through that entire pipeline, we're trying to understand, and again, Tableau helps us, what are the economics of just getting the blood? What are the economics of putting it on a lab machine and making that into DNA or RNA or getting microbiome and banking it? We do a lot of biobanking because we don't know it all. What if we want to go back 10 years, five years, retroactively? We know now we've been tracking this kid over five years. We've seen him come in after emergency room visit after emergency room visit. There's something different about him or her. Now so we've got this repository in. because we've collected it, but there's costs associated with that. You can't sequence everybody. Hmm. Right. Or if you can, it's not, not now. <laughs> yeah. Right. So what Nanova's trying to say is what are the economics behind that, their business, you know, what can hmm. we provide to them to say this is what you would need. Well, and it kind of goes back to Andy's comment saying, could you use the genomic sequencing of these children to understand the population so you can do what is happening in healthcare around value-based reimbursement, around accountable care organizations, you know, the, the whole population health angle. You know, could we use that to help us understand a population and be able to identify those that are in most need and treat them early? I, I think that's uh, your efforts, right? Absolutely. I mean, you look at population health management, it's, it's, it's so emergent, right? Because of this, <laughs> obviously, transition from, you know, to, uh, from fee-for-service to value-based care. And again, we see visionary customers, you know, trying to embrace that with all of these multiple pillars. I just wrote a blog post around that, around how do you do community health assessment? How do you risk stratify your patients? And that's the here and now. Now, if you take, if you connect the dots between what our friends at Innova Health are doing, can you now take risk stratification to birth and, and then be able to drive predictive analytics around that and, and, and again, back to the economics question, so it's an early front-end investment. One can anticipate, again, still to be proven, there's a lot of work to be done, but you'd potentially bend the cost curve because you'll have forecasted the break of acute and chronic diseases mm -hmm. and proactively managed them sure. versus the ballooning cost that the healthcare system is besieged with today. Yeah, and I think that's the point, is that how, what's your number? Exactly. So if I ask a business person, you know, on the research side, it's all cool, it's all, <laughs> these are great things, we can it's publish fun. it, whatever. But at the end of the day, when the health system says, okay, it's still, the $1,000 genome doesn't really exist in, in reality, um, it costs a lot of money. So at $10,000, you are looking at a, quite a bit of money if you're going to sequence. You know, we get 2 million patients a year. You put that <laughs> into a dollar amount, they're going to say, it. no way. So what is the number? And that's, that's, you know, you can ask, you can go to all these conferences that we go to, and we ask that, what's the number? Um, because again, precision medicine isn't the only thing that is in our arsenal. There's a whole other spectrum of therapies that are going on. They want to know what is this going to, how effective this is going to be, what's the cost? And we don't know that right now. Yeah. Interesting. So that's all part of the discovery. I, I, think, I think one of the other challenges, I mean, you're walking the, the, the show floor, 
you see all of these devices capturing all of this data, right? And you throw that in with some electronic medical record, electronic health record data, you know, you, you now, now we're throwing in the genomic sequencing and, and in many ways, you know, I mean, your genome is stored somewhere other than the EHR probably, right? <laughs> and, and your EHR data is somewhere else and now all of these sensors are, you know, stored across maybe, maybe dozens of, of sources, you know? How do we bridge these silos? I mean, what, what, what's the, uh, you know, how, how do we solve this problem of bringing the data together? Well, uh, I could speak to that at first. Uh, one of the things that, you know, even could be an analogy to precision medicine, on the technology side, you walk the floors here and there's tons of technology. I think we have to practice precision technology. It's, it's, it's the right, you know, precision medicine is the right technology or the right uh, treatment for the right person at the right time. Mm -hmm. For technology, we have to think about it the same way. There's plenty of technology out there. <laughs> we want the right technology at the right time for the right purpose Absolutely. at the right cost, mm -hmm. right? So we don't, uh, I, we get flooded with everybody wanting to sell us everything. <laughs> Healthcare is the new hot item, that's why we're here. Um, from our, our perspective, we want to be able to filter through that because most of these technologies companies do not have the expertise to apply it to what we do. And sometimes we don't even because we've seen it, the first time we've seen 10,000 genomes in one place is at these different companies that are, that, are, that are doing this. You know, how can we articulate our needs effectively other than to say, well, we've got big data, we've got messy data, we've got, it's coming out our ears. Sure. How, do we, how do we apply that? So there's, there's significant amount of challenges there. Precision technology, that's an interesting concept. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's also bandwidth issues with project management. Or you let, let me add to that. So a good way of thinking, again, in very pragmatic terms, right? This is coming, right? Still futuristic. Let's look at status quo today. Most healthcare providers are still struggling to make sense of this huge repositories of siloed data that they have. And one, one of the ways to think about it, we see visionary providers doing it with Tableau, is using analytics to bridge what I call the healthcare digital divide. I've had the good fortune or the dubious distinction of having worked across seven industries. No industry has as many different and disparate kinds of IT systems and standards like healthcare does. Hmm. So one of the way, a metaphor we use for Tableau from an analytics perspective is to think of it as the Switzerland of analytics. So while you have your average healthcare provider having invested 15 to $30 million in legacy BI and analytics systems, those are very stack specific and hence they don't talk to each other. So concrete example, Providence Healthcare, the second largest healthcare provider in this country, actually built out its own operation analytics platform sitting across business objects, uh, Epic as its electronic health record, Press Guinea for patient satisfaction, a Lawson for its supply chain management brought it all together uh, with Tableau to build out 40 standard operational reports that is used across their end the second largest healthcare provider in this country, mm -hmm. 76,000 employees from the CEO down to the business analyst. And the results they've seen are pretty astounding. 8% improvement in physician productivity in 12 months, 100% improvement in cancer screenings for colon colorectal breast cancer mm -hmm. just by virtue of that visualization. That's very similar to what Innova is doing on the genomic front, right? So I think there are solutions. Again, it's crawl, walk, run. Uh, you, can, you, you have the holy grail out there in terms of prescriptive analytics, et cetera. My humble learning talking to CXers across this country is most healthcare systems are not there yet. Just being able to drive operational visibility, uh, operational analytics down into the hands of doctors, nurses, clinicians, knowledge workers, business analysts, is a huge challenge, and that's precisely what they work with us. Well, that's, I mean, you, you said precision technology. I think it's precision data as well. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to have a lot of data, but if you don't do something with it, right, you want exactly. to have the right data to solve the right problem. And I think that's nowhere more true than genomics, right, <laughs> which right. is a lot of data, and you need to know what are the two elements that actually indicate that, oh, that's why they're a cancer patient, or that's why they're... Right, and it's the application of that precision technology to get the precision data, to put it in front of the people that can do the best exactly. and, and the most utility with it. And that's not me, that's not an <laughs> informatics person, that's a, a scientist, a researcher, yeah. who wants to ask that particular question. And when we can start to build systems and, and technology that can match how fast they think about this, these problems. Um, these people think fast, and right now, to take these massive amounts of genomic data, petabyte, possibly at an exabyte scale, you know, where, you know, whether you use cloud or whatever, I mean, th these data are large, and expandable. 
to complicated EHR records, if we can put that together with them, and they can start to look at these correlations and interact with it in a self-service way, so I'm, my team isn't the broker of that, I think this thing's gonna break open. Hmm. I think as we mature getting the data into a place that we feel confident that it's quality, it's secure, and then combine it with these next technology tools that are the right tools, I think that's what's gonna make this thing really go. We actually refer to it as actionable insights hmm. for empowerment, which it truly is. I would agree. Right? Interesting. That's what sells. It's a, a doctor, a nurse, or a clinician is not a data scientist. They mm -hmm. are not Excel jocks, and they should not be. Sure. They are primarily in the business of caring for patients. How do you empower them to ask and answer the questions they need without significant IT intervention? Wow. And that's literally what a tool like Tableau, uh, in the hands of bioinformatics, in the hands of clinical research, re researchers, enables, right, as Innova mm -hmm. Health is showing us. I, yeah, I think they'd say big data doesn't matter, actionable insights do. Exactly. If I'm a doctor or <laughs> a researcher. Interesting. Right. And so that even in an application, so one of our other studies is this longitudinal study where our, our kids are coming in through the traditional um, uh, hospital system. We can send them. We, we've been doing this for three years. Uh, we sequence the baby when they're born. And mm -hmm. as they come to the health system, we see them come in. And uh, the data comes in every night and we build models to start to see trends. So population management, we start to stratify. Um, we're doing this, we're going to follow these kids over 18 years. And so again, that's why we bank samples because we haven't discovered it all. So what if we do find that subset of children, we look at their parents because we have their genetics too. We are able to then look at that data. It's sitting there as objects. We go find it. We can do a deeper dive and we can do that all from somebody's interface as opposed to nice. getting on the call and taking two months to get that data together. You know, if we can do that very quickly, get it, get it into the hands of the people that can do the best with it, again, I think that's where um, yeah. we're the most excited about that. Think about how game-changing that is, right? So the context today is what is the risk, who are the highest risk patients in the ED, in the OR, over the next 24, over the next 72 hours, that can potentially exceed my length of stay, you know, parameters. Now you're looking at what is the risk profile over the next 20 years, right, mm -hmm. that you're, you're working on. So it's, 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 it's entirely game changing. It's almost mind boggling when you start to think about it. We are not there yet, but I think these are yeah. concrete foundational steps that helps us make that transition. Yeah. To that and it doesn't take six meetings from a committee uh, to solve. <laughs> although, <laughs> although it does take a group, right? I mean, you know, we were here at CES where you know, people are literally building stuff out of their garage, right? Uh, you know, you can't really do that with uh, genomics. What, what does it take? I mean, what's the team that's involved in, in, in these solutions? Um, I, the, what comes to my mind when we talk about teams, because it's, it's definitely going to be a big team, um, it's this concept of play hard, play together. Um, yeah. Healthcare, the reasons I love it is because people are so passionate about it, they want to help. Exactly. Right? They get into it for a reason. Mm -hmm. and usually it's not glory, yeah. it's, it's still <laughs> passion. Yeah. Right? So the other side of that is um, we need to play together because it's not going to be one institution, one algorithm, one data mass that has this, this being that's going to tell us. It's going to be a combination of people and they need to play together. So it's really balancing that competitive pressure um, of doing the right thing, uh, going fast, going quick to the collaboration, the cooperation that you're going to need to really, again, make this happen quickly. So let me add to that. So again, drawing upon metaphors, there's the intra-enterprise microcosmic picture, right? And what we see in healthcare is, it's actually this borrowing of this concept of concurrent engineering, which automotive invented, which is strategy, marketing, clinical, finance, HR, literally coming together. That's literally what is happening in population health management. Now take that inter-enterprise. Inter One of the most magical things I find about healthcare versus almost any other industry I've worked in is this altruistic notion of, hey, if I have a best practice, I'm going to share it with, with my peers. Because at the end of the day, we are all in the business of delivering high quality of care and saving lives. Yep. And so there's that inter-enterprise collaboration that's happening as well. So my, Microcosm, you know, bringing together multiple functions in a concurrent engineering kind of way, and then literally sharing best, as, as you guys are doing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have multiple visionary industry leaders in this country who want to learn precisely what Innova Health has done, and, and we find that very, very refreshing, and we're very fortunate to partner with them. Excellent. I think that's a great way to finish is, uh, you know, we need to share these ideas. 
So thank you for coming to CES and Digital Health Summit and sharing your insights. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. much.